Test, 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 test. Tá? numa das nossas spin-offs associadas ao técnico, que é a Anne Babel, é também uh, investigador uh, associado do IT e um, ainda é consultor na primeira. Portanto, uma pessoa com montes de ligações uh, às nossas spin-offs do PSD, algo que também nos orgulha imenso. Portanto, uh, Vamos, eu já tive a pensar tentar convencer o André, se calhar vamos fazer uma, uma segunda edição disto, porque obviamente os nossos alunos também não cabem aqui todos e vão estar muito interessados. Isto para mim só significa que o técnico vai ter mesmo que investir fortemente em lecionar o segundo ciclo, pelo menos em Data Science. E pronto, é com muito orgulho e muito obrigado. Ok. Uh, ok, obrigado pelas palavras simpáticas. Deixa-me fazer uma coisa. Como já todos notaram, ok, as you have noticed, we have overflow the, the room. So we are taking measures to move to, in the next sessions to a larger room. So in the next session, probably, we will have to move close to a closer room. Okay? So we have to endure just this for the first session. Mas há aqui assim uma palavrinha onde se podem sentar no chão se quiser. Ok, so is there anyone who doesn't speak Portuguese? Ok, so, uh, two people. so I'm going to, to give this tutorial in English. Uh, can, can you hear me well? Ok, so I'm, uh, I, I just got a cold this week. My voice is not uh, very good. I hope it lasts for the entire five hours. Uh, but I'll give my best try. So, so the, the goal uh, here is to give a, a tutorial on, the, on deep learning uh, without going you know, too deep uh, on uh, the more intricate aspects, but just give kind of the big picture uh, and uh, try to cover uh, some, some breadth. So before starting, I uh, just want to throw two shameless plugs. So I'm going to, to be teaching a new PhD level course uh, for, for, the next, uh, for next year. Uh, the, the course overlaps a lot with the content of this tutorial. It's not just about deep learning, but uh, deep learning is going to be a big part of it. Uh, and the second plug is, is that uh, there's, a, there's one scholarship position that we have available for a project that is also using some of the techniques that I'm, that I'm going to describe here. So if you are interested, or if you know someone who, who is interested, uh, please, please let me know. Uh, okay, so first of all, what is deep learning? Uh, I, and several people can mean uh, you know, slightly different things when they talk about deep learning. Uh, so for some people, deep learning is just neural networks. Uh, it's just uh, another fancy name for, for neural networks, an older name that, that was around for many years. For many years. Uh, other people uh, refer to deep learning as... Uh, Okay, so for some other people, deep learning is not just uh, neural networks, but neural networks with many hidden layers. Uh, and this will be what makes uh, uh, 
de, de learning being deep. Better? Ok. Um, so here we are going to, to be a little bit flexible about this. So uh, deep learning for, for, for the scope of this tutorial is going to be anything that is not shallow. So any, anything beyond uh, uh, shallow or linear models for statistical learning, uh, in particular things that, that use neural networks, uh, are going to be called deep learning here. I'm just going to wait a little bit until things set up. Okay, so, uh, so in particular, a very important aspect uh, of, of these uh, deep learning models is their ability to learn representations. Uh, so this is going to come up uh, during, during this tutorial. Uh, and this, you know, another perspective on deep learning is that uh, it's distinctive because it's able to learn representations as opposed to rely on feature engineering. Um, so it's, it's not a form of learning that is really intense and profound in case you you consider that one. Uh, so the second question is why did deep learning become mainstream? Um, so there's been lots of recent breakthroughs. Uh, so if you are, uh, uh, if you if you have been seeing the news, you might have noticed that there's been uh, a lot of progress uh, recently in object recognition, uh, in speech processing, in natural language processing, uh, in machine translation, uh, in robotics with uh, autonomous vehicles and so on. Uh, there's been some some uh, uh, interesting news. So, for example, this year, uh, much earlier than expected, uh, there was a machine that was able to beat uh, a human grandmaster uh, in Go. Uh, and there's no signs of slowing down. So the the trend is for you know these breakthroughs to keep uh, to keep coming and and growing. Uh, so here are some examples of of recent headlines, uh, like Microsoft system that outperforms humans in image recognition. Uh, AI that is as good as humans at listening on the phone. Sometimes there's a little bit of exaggeration. I don't believe that AI is as good as humans, but uh, you know, for some tasks they can actually achieve superhuman performance. But in speech recognition, machine translation, I, I have some doubts. So you need to. So big companies have big PRs that uh, exaggerate things a little bit. Um, so there's there's a very recent uh, article featured uh, in the New York Times uh, last week called the Great AI Awakening. It, uh, it basically, uh, it's, it's quite long. It explains the story of uh, the Google Brain team and uh, the several steps that they did to, to introduce uh, 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 neural network systems for machine translation. Uh, I, I found it really interesting. Uh, so the achievement here is, is a neural machine translation, basically using neural networks to do machine translation. There was a big uh, jump in, in uh, in performance by, by doing this. Again, this is still not at human level, despite what the news may say, but uh, it's much better than the systems that existed before. Um, so this is an example for uh, self-driving cars. Uh, and this is the famous uh, event where AlphaGo, uh, the, the machine set up by DeepMind, uh, was able to beat a, a human champion uh, by four against one. Uh, it was a, a pretty good achievement, and differently from uh, things that have happened in the past, for example, IBM Watson, when, uh, when it uh, defeated uh, Kasparov, uh, the method that they used was not a brute force method, so it's a little bit smarter than, than, the, than the deep blue machine that existed, uh, I don't know how much time ago, like 20 years ago, something like that. 
So finally, we should ask why now? Uh, and I think that's you know, probably some of you are thinking, why is all this, uh, um, why are so many people talking about deep learning now uh, if uh, most of the technology that people are using existed already, uh, if the methods existed already 50 years ago? Um, or, well, maybe not 50, but, uh, but a lot of time ago. So uh, it's true that many of the core ideas are there for a long time. Uh, I think the crucial difference here is that now we have more data, and data is crucial to, to make neural networks work well. Um, we have more computing power. This is important because training neural networks has always been uh, one of the weaknesses. Uh, so research in neural networks kind of stopped uh, for f or, or decreased uh, by a long time because no one was being able to, to train them uh, effectively. Uh, so now with more computing power, that's easier. Uh, there's also better software engineering, and this is very important. Uh, we usually don't care that much about uh, you know, the engineering aspects, even though this is an engineering school, but uh, the, the fact that uh, now we have uh, uh, many open source projects, uh, many groups uh, collaborating, uh, people are more organized working in different problems uh, within deep learning, progress is moving much faster. Uh, and, and finally, and this is the, uh, the exciting part, there's also been a few algorithm innovations. Uh, so this is not just reinventing the wheel. There's been some innovations there um, that, that were quite important to actually make neural network networks work. For example, uh, being able to train networks with many layers by developing new training techniques. Uh, the introduction of new activation functions like rectified linear units. Uh, better ways of initializing and setting up learning rates, better optimization. Uh, new techniques like dropout. Uh, convolutional networks, long short-term memories. I'm going to talk about all this stuff in the, in the, in the sequel. <coughs> so another argument uh, that skeptics use, I used to say this, uh, or at least uh, part of my skepticism some time ago was related to uh, neural networks involving non-convex optimization, uh, which can be tricky because uh, if you are optimizing an objective function that is non-convex, you, you might have a problem with the local minima. Uh, so uh, the, the why does gradient-based optimization work at all with neural networks despite the non-convexity? Uh, so uh, there are some uh, reasons for that. Uh, I think we, we don't have a very strong theoretical result explaining why this works. There are some end-waving arguments, so I'm going to stick with the end-waving ones. Uh, so basically, we have many, many hidden units. Uh, there are, I think the second one is really important. There are many ways the neural net can approximately uh, implement the desired input-output relationship. So neural networks are very effective at approximating functions uh, and they can do it in many different ways. Uh, and if you, if you care about uh, a particular application in machine learning, you just need to find one. You don't need to find all solutions. You, and uh, it, there is some, some uh, end-waving evidence that uh, uh, in neural networks, a lot of the local minima are good minima, meaning that even though you don't get the global minima, the local minima are still good for the task that you, that you are trying to solve. Again, this is end waving, but I think something that is lacking in, in the neural networks and deep learning is to have more people uh, working on the theoretical side, trying to explain how things work. Um, th this will be really, really exciting. So uh, here's a kind of the big picture uh, this, so this comes from a presentation by Marco Aurelio Gonzato and probably using previous stuff from Jan Kuhn. Uh, so um, this is showing you know, the, the big panor panorama where you have supervised methods, uh, and so methods for supervised learning, for unsupervised learning, shallow methods and deep methods. I, I'm not sure if I fully agree with the position of all the points here, uh, but on the shallow uh, and the supervised side, we have things like support vector machines, uh, boosting the perceptron. Uh, if you move to the, to the deep part, but still supervised, we get uh, neural networks and several uh, types of neural networks. Uh, and uh, if you move to the, to the bottom part, and this is, the, the, you know, this is where most of the unsolved problems uh, lie right now, uh, we have uh, things like restricted Boltzmann machines, uh, um, autoencoders, deep belief networks, uh, and so on. So, uh, and uh, along this tutorial, we are going to uh, kind of concentrate in, in, in this circle. If you, if you look carefully to these points, this kind of forms a circle here. Uh, 
so we're going to cover, to start with the shallow learning, then move to uh, 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 deep supervised methods, then, uh, and then we'll talk just a little bit on the end on this part. This part we are not going to talk a lot. <coughs> Uh, okay, so another thing to mention, if you are really uh, interested in learning more about this subject, uh, there's a book that just came out. Uh, the, uh, so it's, it's, it's been written by uh, uh, Ian uh, Goodfellow, Joshua Benji, and Aaron Clouville. Uh, the chapters are publicly available, so uh, at least for now. Uh, so we can go to this site and, and, uh, and see the chapters. Uh, and uh, I, so I didn't read the entire book, but from what I've seen so far, I, I think it's well written. So it's a, it's a good place to, to find more detailed information about some of the stuff that I'm going to describe here. Okay, so uh, here's an outline of the talk. Uh, so I don't know if I'll be able to cover everything, but uh, the tentative plan, at least, is to uh, cover the first uh, four uh, sections in the morning starting with linear classifiers, then neural networks, then how to train, then a little bit about representation learning, and then cover the last four uh, in the afternoon. So let's see how it goes. Um, so let's start with linear classifiers. Uh, and uh, the roadmap for this part is, I'm going to start just introducing some, some notation, uh, describe what are classification problems, regression problems, and so on, uh, talk a little bit about feature representations, uh, then uh, a little bit about linear classifiers, and then to give a motivating example, and to start to open the, the, the pave the way for, t for for deep learning, I'm going to to, to talk about the, the a very simple algorithm, the perception, uh, and uh, and talk about the one of the guarantees of perception, which is the mistake bound, but also some of the limitations of perception. Uh, okay, so let's uh, set up some notation here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about supervised learning problems uh, where we, there is some input x uh, that lives in some space uh, calligraphic x. We can regard this input, for example, uh, as a news article, as an image, uh, whatever data we are trying to, to, to classify. Uh, so in this example, it's a document. Uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's a news article uh, describing the, the AlphaGo achievements. Uh, and we assume that there is some output y that lives in another set y, a set of uh, labels that could be, for example, is this news article uh, true or fake? Now people are talking a lot about fake news and techniques to detect fake news, so this will be an interesting application. Um, another possible output could be the topic for the document. Is it about sports, about politics, technology, and so on? Uh, in the case of images, uh, the output could just be an, Im an image segmentation uh, that detects ob objects uh, in the image. So in any case, the goal uh, is to learn a classifier, which is just a function uh, denoted by phi here, that maps from the input space to the output space. So this is what we want to do. Uh, and we want to learn this function from a set of examples. This is our training data. So our training data consists of pairs, where we have, for example, documents and topics. Uh, we have several of them. The many we have, the better. The more we have, the better. Uh, and uh, we want to use these examples to fit uh, a, a classifier that is able to generalize well for uh, data points that, was, that were never seen. Uh, to the point that if I now provide a new news article about some other topic, uh, the, the, this function still uh, is able to uh, predict uh, as accurately as possible the topic of that news article. Uh, so there are many different frameworks that fit, uh, or many different problems that fit this framework. Uh, in regression, the output space uh, is, is, it can be a real line if you are just uh, regressing on one variable. If we are doing it with several variables, uh, it's called multivariate regression, then uh, it's the Euclidean space. Uh, here in the tutorial, we're going to talk more about classification problems, where instead of predicting a continuous variable, we are predicting a discrete one, in particular a finite one. Uh, so in binary classification, we just have two labels. So this could be, for example, for the problem of detecting if a news article is fake or not, this could be the two classes, fake, not fake. Um, for, for topic detection, uh, we can have more than two topics, so it makes sense to talk about multi-class classification, where the output space uh, can have more than two labels, so one, two K. 
uh, there's also another class of problems uh, that I'm uh, mentioning here, but we're not, well, we're going to, to talk about some of them in the afternoon, uh, called structured classification, where uh, the, the distinctive aspect here is that uh, the, the outputs that we're trying to predict are highly structured and, uh, and uh, the, the output space is, is very large. So for example, if you have a sequence uh, as input and you want to predict a label for each element of that sequence, typically uh, there is a lot of correlation between labels uh, for elements of the sequence that are next to each other. So there is a lot of structure. And, this, uh, and also the number of possible sequence labelings grows exponentially fast with the length of the sequence. Uh, so these kind of problems are better uh, tackled in the framework of structured classification, even though they are still multi-class classification. So the distinctive aspect here is, is that it's not feasible to enumer enumerate all classes when doing our prediction. So we need to do something smarter. Uh, machine translation is a good example of that, uh, where we are trying to predict an output that is an entire sentence of varying length. Uh, okay, so sometimes to solve these problems, it's convenient to, to do reductions, to reduce uh, one of these problems to a simpler one. For example, if we are doing multi-class classification, uh, one way of doing that is just to reduce uh, the multi-class classification problem to several uh, one versus all classification problems that are binary classification problems, and then use a voting scheme or something else to convert that into a final decision. And the same way for structured classification. So one way of doing that is to, to do greedy search. Uh, for example, for the problem of uh, uh, predicting labels in a sequence, we can just predict one label at a time and condition our history of past decisions to predict the, the subsequent labels. These methods are not perfect. They can propagate errors and so on. But it's just a simple way of reducing uh, a more complicated problem, like structural classification, to a simpler one. Uh, some other times, uh, we cannot afford error propagation, or, and it's just better to tackle the problem in its native form. Uh, so the, the very important uh, thing of uh, shallow uh, learning methods uh, is, uh, is feature representation. And uh, this is going to... Uh, so when you see how this is done in deep learning, this is where we start enjoying uh, deep learning more than, than we do for shallow learning. So feature uh, engineering uh, is a very important step uh, in these methods. Uh, so it's really important if you're trying to solve, uh, for example, a classification problem, to choose, to choose our features, features that describe our data, uh, in a very clever way. Um, so for example, if we are doing document classification, possible features could be just a bag of words. Uh, so if, if some of you have worked in the uh, text, natural language processing, we might have used uh, bag of words features already. So this is basically taking uh, a news article, a document, and uh, representing that document as a, a multi-set of, uh, of words, or, or for example, words with counts. Like uh, we, uh, the dimension of your vector representing the document is going to be the entire vocabulary of words, and then you, you, you associate uh, a number to, to each dimension, to each word, that is, for example, the total number, so the, the count, the number of times uh, each word occurs in the document. And this could be your feature representation for the document. Uh, for images, uh, usually you use, uh, so I, I don't do image processing. I don't know much about the topic, but I think that at least for a long time, it was popular to use things like sift features, wavelet representations. These are typical uh, features that are used in computer vision. Uh, for other problems, and also for some of these problems, uh, we also need to use other kinds of categorical Boolean and continuous features. Uh, so the typical approach uh, in these methods uh, is to define a feature map, uh, a map that goes, a map psi that goes from our input space X uh, to the Euclidean space. Uh, in the case of a pack of words representation, X will be the space of all possible text documents and uh, uh, the Euclidean space will be vectors uh, representing word counts uh, in, in the Euclidean space. Uh, so, uh, and, and actually, if, if you do multi-class or structured classification, it's more convenient instead of considering a feature that just maps uh, inputs to the to, to, to feature space, to consider uh, a joint feature map. Uh, so a map uh, phi, uh, that goes from the, 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 
the product of the input set and the, the output set to the Euclidean space. So this is uh, basically considering joint features, features that depend not just on the input, but also on the possible, the candidate outputs. Uh, <coughs> so one simple way of doing that uh, is, for example, for the, for the topic uh, classification problem, uh, we can assume that uh, this vector phi of x, um, actually it should be psi, psi of x, uh, so this vector could encode uh, counts for all the words that occur in the, in the document, so the dimension of this vector is going to be the size of the vocabulary, and the entries are going to be counts, and take uh, the, 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 the Kronecker product with an indicator vector that uh, that's, uh, uh, has basic basically one uh, on the dimension corresponding to the candidate topic that we are considering, for example sports, and zero for all possible uh, other topics. So if you do this product and if you flatten everything in a vector, you get a bunch of zeros. These zeros uh, are associated to every topic that is not sports. Uh, and uh, the features psi, so this should be psi, uh, are uh, basically uh, condensed in the same uh, segment uh, of this vector. So this is, uh, this is convenient and you know, it's going to be clear uh, in a while after we uh, talk about the perception algorithm. So is there any questions so far? Is this clear up to this point? Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so let's, let's now uh, talk about linear classifiers. So we define uh, different kinds of uh, machine learning problems. Uh, and now let's talk about the class uh, uh, of, of classifiers that are linear. So the idea here is that uh, we have introduced uh, these, uh, these features, uh, this joint feature map phi uh, that depends <coughs> on the input x and the output y. Uh, the typical thing that we do next uh, is to parameterize the model that assigns a weight to each of the features. So we have a weight vector w uh, that lives in the same space as the feature vector. Uh, so it, it has one weight per feature uh, and, uh, and we are going to use this weight vector and the features to assign a score for every possible output. So again, if you are doing uh, document uh, classification, topic classification, then we need to get, uh, we need to compute uh, uh, a score for every possible topic and one very simple way of doing that is just to take the inner product between the weight vector and the feature vector. So we do this for every y, which is every topic, uh, we obtain a different score for, for each topic, a score for sports, a score for politics, a score for technology, and so on. And then you just do the argmax, uh, and you predict the topic that maximizes that score. Um, so, so the crucial thing here, and the reason why this is called a linear classifier, is that this score function uh, is linear uh, with respect to the parameters. So the parameters here are the weight vectors, these are the parameters of the classifier, and the score function is linear on these parameters. This is why this is called a linear classifier. Um, so there are several examples uh, of classifiers that, uh, that fit this framework, that can be written in this form. Uh, for example, the perception is an example. Uh, naive base, even though naive base is typically described in a different way, uh, by defining uh, probabilities and uh, conditional independence and so on, uh, I if you write down all the uh, parameters of the naive, naive base models, which are the probability estimates, we can also write it in the form above. It's actually a good exercise to do if you never did it. Uh, so naive base is also a linear classifier. Uh, so I'm talking about naive base for topic classification, where you, you basically have uh, labels and you say that all your features are independent, conditioned on the label. Uh, logistic regression is another example of a linear classifier. It again has a probabilistic flavor, but uh, uh, in the end, when you are doing a prediction, we are applying a rule like that. Um, and support, support vector machines are uh, yet another example. Uh, so graphically, uh, if, we, if we represent graphically what a linear classifier is doing, we end up with something like this. So for binary classification, um, uh, a linear classifier is just an hyperplane plane uh, separating uh, two classes of points. So we can regard these blue dots and the red dots as uh, our, our training sets where the blue ones are negative examples and the red ones are positive. Uh, and what we are trying to do is to find an hyperplane plane that separates the two. So the decision of the classifier is going to be 
is, is uh, our new point on this side or this side? If it's on this side, it's going to predict uh, positive or blue. I forgot which is positive and which is negative. If it is on this side, you predict red. Uh, so if you go to more than two classes, uh, we get something similar. Uh, it, in this case, it's going to be an intersection of hyperplanes. And you know, to understand why this is going to be an intersection of hyperplanes, if you look at the formula for the argmax, this is going to this is a, a piecewise uh, um, linear function, uh, and it's it's uh, it's going to be for if you do this for every y, we are going to get uh, uh, the intersection uh, of uh, uh, of uh, so you are trying to maximize uh, uh, things that are described by different hyperplanes, and so the boundaries uh, that define our decisions are going to, to, be, to lie on the intersection of these several uh, hyperplanes. So in this case, we have three hyperplanes because there are three classes. They all intersect in this point. And these lines are uh, intersections, like pairwise intersections, between two topics. So in the end, this is, this is still what we get. Um, so I, I forgot to mention, but if you have any questions or anything, feel free to interrupt with questions. OK. so. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, the perceptron, uh, which is a very old uh, learning algorithm. Um, <coughs> so the perceptron was invented in uh, 1957, uh, so more than 50 years ago, um, at, at the Cornell uh, Aeronautical Laboratory uh, by Rosenblatt. And uh, the perceptron is just not just a theoretical device. It was an actual device. It was implemented in hardware. It was this uh, machine full of wires that you see here in this picture. Um, it was called Mark I Perceptron. So I don't know if you can see it, but if you look at the top, the, the name Mark I Perceptron is there. Uh, and uh, it was designed initially for image, image recognition, but uh, the ambition was that you can use it to solve any, any learning problem. Um, and so uh, we are going to present the perception algorithm in detail, uh, and we are going to see that there are uh, some weight updates uh, during the course of the algorithm. The updates are actually performed uh, by by electric motors, so the, everything was uh, built in hardware, and the, the weights were encoding in in potentiometers. So yeah. Uh, so when when uh, the perception was invented, there was a lot of excitement in the news. Uh, pretty much the same way as you see it these days with deep learning. Um, so the title of this New York Times piece was New Navy Device Learns by Doing, because this was a project uh, sponsored by the US Navy. Uh, and you could see some very bold claims there. For example, Dr. Uh, Rosenblatt, which was the inventor, uh, uh, said perceptrons might be fired to the planet as mechanical space explorers. Uh, or Later, perceptions will be able to recognize people and call out their names and instantly translate speech in one language to speech or writing in another language. Uh, in principle, it will be possible to build brains that could reproduce themselves on an assembly line and which will be conscious of their existence. So, <laughs> very, very ambitious. Um, so, unfortunately, it, it took longer. Or it's still taking time to get uh, off of this. So. So let's go to the actual algorithm. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple algorithm. Uh, so it's, it's nice because it's, it's simple. Uh, and the way it works is as follows. So the input is, a, is our training set, so a set of <laughs> labeled data, pairs xi, yi. Um, we, we start by, uh, uh, so the goal is to, is to obtain the weights of our model, the parameters of our model, okay? the w vector. Uh, and the way this is, uh, this is working is we first initialize the weight vector to all zeros. Uh, we, we keep a counter of the number of mistakes that we, that we, that we initialize to zero. Uh, and then we have a loop uh, that we repeat uh, until we exceed the maximum number of epochs or until no more mistakes uh, are, are being done. Where at each point we sample a new training example, so a new pair xi, yi. Uh, we use the current model WK uh, to make a prediction for this example XI. So this is going to be the prediction YI at, 
this is the prediction uh, coming from the current configuration uh, of, of uh, the current model. Uh, and then two things can happen. Either we got the, the label right, you, we guessed the right topic for the document, or, or we did a mistake. Uh, if the topic is correct, we don't do anything because the model is just good, let's not touch it. Uh, if we did a mistake, then we need to update the model. And the update is very, very simple. So this is essentially the line that characterizes the perception algorithm. So we are taking the current model, uh, WK, we are uh, summing uh, the feature vector corresponding to the true example. So YI is the true label. Uh, so we are summing the feature vector corresponding to the true label. And we are subtracting uh, the feature vector co corresponding to the, wrong, to the predicted label, which is wrong in this case. Okay. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, we need to give more weight to features that are associated to the true label and we need to remove weight from features uh, that are associated to the wrong label. So this is what this rule is doing. Uh, and, and also we need to increment the number of mistakes. Um, and we keep going until we are tired or until perception starts updating because uh, we, it doesn't do any mistakes uh, at some point. Uh, so at, at first glance, this looks a little bit like a hack. Like the first time I saw this, I saw, okay, this kind of makes uh, sense. It's very intuitive, but I don't believe that this has any interesting guarantees. Uh, this just looks like a, you know, very a smart way of, uh, okay, let's put more weight in some places, remove weight from others, but yeah, I was not expecting anything theoretically interesting. Uh, but it turns out that we can prove uh, a very interesting result uh, with this simple algorithm. Uh, so to prove that, I need to introduce a couple of definitions. Uh, so we say that the training data uh, is linearly separable uh, with some margin. Uh, we, we use the letter gamma to, uh, to denote the margin. Uh, if and only if there is some weight vector u that has unit norm uh, such that the score, like for any, for any point in the training data, any i, uh, the score of the true label, so the true topic for that document, exceeds the score of any other topic uh, by at least uh, the quantity gamma, which is the margin. So this is what means to separate the data uh, with some margin. And the reason why we are fixing the, the norm of the vector uh, to be 1 is that uh, if you don't fix it, then we can increase the, we can scale up uh, u to increase the margin. So we don't want that. That's why uh, the, the norm of u is fixed. Okay. Um, so graphically, uh, if you if you look at the previous, if you look at these pictures, uh, the separation margin would correspond to these distances, these distances here. Okay. Um, Okay, the second definition is the radius of the data. Uh, this is a simpler one. So it's just the, the data point uh, for which the norm uh, between the true uh, feature vector, the feature vector for the true label, and the feature vectors for any other label uh, uh, is, is maximal. So uh, we call R to this radius. Uh, so then, uh, given these definitions, we have this uh, bound on the number of mistakes. Uh, so this, this was established in 62 by Novikov. Uh, so the theorem says that the perception algorithm is guaranteed to find the separating hyperplane uh, after at most uh, this number of mistakes. So this is uh, the square of the radius divided by the square of the margin. So again, this kind of makes sense. Like if, you, if the margin is small, uh, the data is uh, it's harder to separate because the distance between so this distance is going to be smaller. So the perception does more mistakes until it gets a separating hyperplane. If the margin is large, then the number of mistakes uh, is going down. And a similar rationale can be applied to the radius of the data. So, um, so the, 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 the another interesting thing, and interesting enough so that I show here, this is the only proof that I'm going to show in this tutorial, uh, is that we can prove this in one slide. Uh, and the proof is, is very, very nice. Um, so the way we're going to prove this bound is by first establishing a lower bound on the norm of the weights at the, after the case mistake. And then we're going to establish a, an upper bound. Uh, we're going to take the two bounds side by side. And uh, from there, 
uh, the mistake bound of perception will emanate automatically. So to prove the lower bounds, what you are going to do is to take uh, this unit vector u, the one that we assumed that existed, because the data was, is assumed to be linearly separable. Uh, so we are going to take this uh, weight vector with unit norm that separates the data <laughs> with margin gamma, uh, and we are going to consider the inner product between this vector u and the, the current model after k mistakes, w k plus 1. Uh, and so by using the update rule of perception, we can just write wk plus 1 as wk plus this, the difference of the two feature vectors. Uh, then uh, by the definition of the, uh, of the margin, we know that uh, this part uh, is larger than or equal to, to delta. Actually, we called it gamma before. So this is the separation margin. Um, so, and then if we apply this uh, inequality uh, k times, where k is the number of mistakes, then we get uh, this result. This inner product I is uh, lower bounded by k times the separation margin. And now to convert this into a, a bound on the norm, uh, we just use the cauchy schwarz inequality. So we can write uh, the norm uh, of w as a product of these two norms, because u, by assumption, uh, has a unit norm. Um, so, uh, and using cauchy schwarz inequality, this has to be larger than this inner product, and we have the bound for the inner product, so we can immediately plug here. So we get that the norm uh, of the weight vector is uh, lower bounded by k times uh, the separation margin. So it's very simple to prove this part. The second part is even simpler. Uh, so let's now establish an upper bound on the norm. Uh, we just uh, take the definition of WK plus 1 using the perception, uh, the, the update rule for perception. So WK plus 1 is WK plus difference in features, uh, or yeah, so uh, minus the difference in features. So, um, so we, can, we can just uh, uh, take the square of that, expand uh, the square of the norm, and we get an expression like this. Then we know that since the perception predicted y high hat, and the, the, the way the perception uh, makes, makes predictions is by doing the argmax. So this is basically this part of the algorithm. So y hat is the score that uh, is the, the label that maximizes this score. Uh, so since we know that, then we know that this part has to be uh, negative. Uh, posit uh, uh, I think there might be a, a, a sign which is wrong here. So this is larger than that. Yeah, I think uh, this should be minus here because the update rule is this. Um, yeah, well, something is fishy here. But uh, basically, uh, the, the conclusion here is that this part is uh, upper bounded by the radius of the data. Um, because, so, sorry, this, this part is uh, less than, no, it's correct. So this part is less than zero because this feature vector, uh, so the score uh, for the prediction uh, y i at needs to be larger than the score of the true label, right? Um, and this means that this term is negative or non-positive. Non and from there, and bounding this term by the radius of the data, we get this. And now applying this k times, you get this upper bound. This, uh, yeah, this upper bound. So the, the, the square of the norm is bounded by k times the square of the radius of the data. And now we just take away uh, the two sides. We just put the two bounds side by side. We get this inequality. And from that, we, in solving with respect to k, we get the, the perception mistake bound. So it's very simple to establish. Um, so. Uh, this is nice, so uh, I've said nice things about perception. Uh, if the data is separable, it manages to separate the data. But this raises the question about when is the data separ separable, linearly separable. Uh, so the perception can solve uh, linearly separable problems. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, overfitting <coughs> here, so I'm assuming that uh, uh, finding a separating hyperplane is, is enough. Uh, I'm not talking about the generalization error for now. Um, so we have seen that the perception can solve linear, linearly separable problems. So for example, if you have two inputs and, uh, and, we are and the our target function is a logic function of these two inputs, 
It can solve the OR of the two inputs, the end of the two inputs, where one is negated and the other around. It finds the separating hyperplane that separates these points. But uh, if we, if we uh, have a different function like an XOR, and we use the, the standard uh, input representation, uh, we get to a point where these two classes, uh, this data set is not separable. So there is no hyperplane that can separate uh, the circles from the triangles. Uh, so perception cannot solve this. This was observed by Minsky and Papert in 69. And uh, after that observation, there was very strong criticisms of perception. Suddenly, people didn't believe that we could put uh, 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 sh spaceships uh, send, uh, and, and uh, kind of uh, have an assembly line of brains because it could not even uh, solve uh, the exor problem. Uh, of course, uh, if we transform the input to a better representation, so for example, if instead of using x1 and x2 directly, we use a transformation of the two, uh, then we can get then we can get uh, linear superability again. But this required an important step. So we needed, some engineer needed to jump in and say, oh, we cannot do this this way. Let's transform the input. Let's do feature engineering. And then you got linear superability. Um, OK, so is there any question at this point? Is this very obvious to everyone? Did you know already about this? Or is this new? OK, so how, how many, just to get an idea, how many of you have seen the perception algorithm already? Ah, OK, so maybe I'm losing time in this, in this part. Um, OK, good. So, uh, so perception is very simple. Uh, there are more uh, uh, interesting, uh, from a statistical perspective, more interesting uh, linear classifiers uh, with better guarantees, uh, guarantees that involve not just being able to separate the training data but also to generalize to unseen data. Uh, so an example is logistic regression. Uh, it's defined, uh, it's a probabilistic model uh, where we take our inner product between the weight vector and the feature vector. Uh, we exponentiate it, we normalize it, and this immediately defines a probability distribution, uh, like a conditional probability distribution, uh, probability of, of the class Y uh, condition on the, the input X. Uh, and then to train a model like this, we just maximize the conditional uh, log likelihood of the training data with some regularization. Uh, in support factor machines, uh, uh, kind of the, 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 the idea is similar to perception in the sense that we are also uh, shooting for finding a, a separating hyperplane. <coughs> the major difference is that we don't want any separating hyperplane. We want the hyperplane that maximizes the separation margin. Uh, so we want to find, because the perception doesn't guarantee that it finds the hyperplane, the best hyperplane. It just states that it finds one. Uh, the, the, in the SVMs, uh, we are explicitly optimizing so that we get the hyperplane that maximizes the separation margin. Um, and so if the data is not separable, uh, or if you don't want to overfit the training data too much, we, uh, we also use psych variables. Uh, and you penalize viol violations uh, uh, of, of the, of the uh, separation margin conditions. So I'm not going into details here. Uh, the main thing that, that, uh, that we should uh, know is that both logistic regression, support factor machines, and other models, they lead to convex optimization problems. Uh, so we don't have any issues with local minima, how to initialize. So even in the perception algorithm, if you remember the algorithm that I was showing here, the weights were just initialized to zero, all zeros. So it doesn't matter because at the end, uh, well, in the perception case, uh, I cannot make that claim. But for SVMs or logistic regression, uh, at the end, we are always going to get the same solution. Uh, so the other important uh, thing to keep in mind is that both SVMs and logistic regression assume that the features are well engineered such that the data is linearly separable or at least nearly linearly separable. So if you have like a bunch of uh, points where some of them are inside a circle and the others are uh, uh, around the circle. This is not going to work, so it's not a good idea to apply uh, SVMs or logistic regression directly without transforming the input space. So this raises the question about what can we do if the data is not separable, is not linearly separable. Um, so the first idea, an obvious one, but we should not uh, underestimate it, is just to go there and manually engineer better features. This works very often. 
people have been doing this for decades uh, and in very clever ways. Sometimes you have very good intuitions about what kind of features you want to design to solve your problem. Uh, so the work of, of engineers is, is quite important here. Um, but uh, if you don't want to do that, maybe you want to consider using kernel methods um, that uh, have a very beautiful theory behind. Uh, the idea is that they, they are going to work implicitly in a high dimensional feature space uh, w without the need of caring directly about, the so we don't need to do computations on this high dimensional feature space. You just use a kernel function to do all the operations that are needed uh, to, learn, to learn your model. Uh, but uh, it doesn't completely solve the problem because you still need to choose a good kernel. Uh, you can do it by trying several, uh, uh, tuning some hyperparameters and so on, um, but, but you need to do it. So this is kind of a replacement for feature engineering. Uh, also, the other limitation uh, is that the capacity of the model uh, is confined to kernels that are positive definite. Uh, so this is still uh, a linear classifier uh, where we can work with a large uh, feature space, but we, it's still not as general as a neural network as we're going to see after, after this. Uh, so the difference between these two is that in one case we are working in a, pri in a primal space, in case of kernel methods you are working in a dual space, but the issue is still there. Uh, so the next uh, alternative, uh, I mean, there, there are others besides, besides these, but uh, this is one that I'm going to talk about, is neural networks, uh, where basically you need to be ready to, to embrace non-convexity uh, if you want to use neural networks. Uh, now, the, instead of, it's, it's not the case that you don't need to do engin engin any engineering, it's uh, definitely not the case. But you are not going to engineer features. That's the main idea. You can still do it, but it's, it's not the point of using neural networks. Uh, so neural networks are supposed to find good internal representations themselves. So instead of spending effort engineering features or engineering kernels, the point is that we are going to spend some time tuning the model architecture, uh, tuning, uh, tweaking hyperparameters, uh, running several experiments, you know, finding good ways of uh, making the computation be efficient and so on. So there's still a job for, for, for engineers. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the second part. So and what time is the break, just to get an idea? So, so now it's 10.30. Okay. We should break earlier because um, we are going to move to the largest room at ISP, the Congress Center of Cyber the next session will be there. So in order to, to take, um, take time for the coffee break, which is going to be served, um, after the moving ground, we should stop in about five minutes. Okay. So we have time to do everything. Is that okay? Okay, that, that sounds fine. Okay. Yeah, okay, so if, if someone wants to take this chance to make questions, I can pause here. No questions? Otherwise, I can, I can also present five minutes of this. Uh, and then break in, in the middle of this section. Okay, let's, let's do more five minutes. Um, okay, so here's a, here's a, a roadmap uh, for this section. I'm going to start with the, by presenting the artificial neuron. Um, uh, we are going to describe, I'm going to describe activation functions, then multi-layer neural networks. This is where things start to get interesting. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, softmax and sparsemax. This is going to become clearer. And then end with the universal approximation theorem that uh, states uh, something about the capacity of neural networks. <coughs> so, uh, so here's a picture uh, representation of the biological neuron. I have to say that I don't know anything about the biological neuron. So if, if some of you know it, feel free to jump in and uh, correct uh, whatever I'm saying. So basically, there are three interesting parts. Uh, one is the main bo body, uh, called the soma. Uh, there are uh, dendrites, which are these uh, things here. And there is an axon that uh, uh, connects um, uh, the, the, nu the, the nucleus, the, the soma, to, to axon terminals. And then these axon terminals are connected to other dendrites of other neurons by synapses. Uh, and the way neurons communicate with each other is by uh, uh, generating uh, spikes, uh, like very sharp uh, 
uh, electrical uh, potentials uh, across the cell membrane. So, for example, these are very, very sharp. So, uh, around five milliseconds. Uh, and they do this uh, massively in parallel. Uh, so this is the major signaling unit of the nervous system, uh, neurons activating each other uh, by means of these spikes. Um, so the, a word of caution here, uh, most of the inspiration in neural networks come from the biological neuron, but the artificial neuron model is very, very different from the biological one. So this is like comparing a cow with a sphere. Uh, so the artificial uh, neuron uh, is a, a, a rough simplification uh, of the other model. Uh, the, it has two uh, important parts. Uh, one is a preactivation. So there is a unit here. Uh, so we call this uh, the artificial neuron. Uh, there are some inputs, uh, x1 to xd. Uh, so these are scholars. They are real numbers. Uh, there is a bias term. And uh, we compute a linear function of these inputs uh, and the bias, so uh, an affine function, uh, by uh, taking the inner product of a weight vector w with x and summing the bias term. So this is just a linear function. We call it z of x. <coughs> this is just a linear function of the, uh, an affine function of the inputs. Uh, so uh, we call uh, these uh, weights the connection weights, and b is the bias term. Uh, and we call the entire thing the preactivation. So z of x is the preactivation. Uh, then the, the interesting part comes after that. Uh, there is an activation. There is a, a function g, uh, typically nonlinear, uh, that comes after this linear, um, this linear part. Uh, and the output of the neuron is going to be this h of x, which is the composition of this activation g with the output z of x. So this is the activation following the preactivation. Uh, and it's going to output something more interesting. So let's see what kind of activation functions uh, are typically used uh, in neural networks. So I'm going to talk about um, linear activation functions, uh, which are not very interesting. Then uh, we're going to talk about sigmoids, hyperbolic tangents, and the rectified linear unit, which is more recent. So the linear uh, <coughs> activation is just the identity function. So it's not particularly interesting. Uh, it doesn't uh, squash the inputs, unlike others that we're going to see. Uh, one interesting aspect is that uh, if you start taking these neurons and plugging them on top of each other, and this is going to be the focus of uh, multi-layer perceptrons, as we'll be talking about in a minute, uh, composing layers of linear units uh, is just composing linear functions. So at the end, we are still going to get a linear function. Uh, so we are not gaining any expressive power by doing that. But uh, it's not completely useless uh, because depending on how we choose the number uh, of uh, hidden units, this is going to become clear a little bit later, uh, we can use this to reduce the dimensionality of the inputs to a lower dimension, m pretty much like we do PCA and, uh, and other uh, machine learning methods. So linear activations are still useful in some cases. Uh, the most used activation, or one of the most used, is the sigmoid activation, uh, which is uh, it's basically, basically the logistic function. Some of you might have uh, uh, seen this function under the name of logistic function. Uh, so this function squashes the neuron preactivation between 0 and 1. So it, z can, it can be anywhere in the real line, and the output is always between 0 and 1. And because it's between 0 and 1, we can interpret it as a probability. Um, it's, uh, it's also a probability that is uh, always positive, so it's never zero. Uh, z needed to be minus infinity to be, to be zero, um, and it's also never one. Uh, it's also uh, strictly increasing. Um, and uh, uh, so if you just add one neuron and this activation, you can immediately implement logistic regression, because logis so binary logistic regression. Because logistic regression is essentially uh, defining the conditional probability of the uh, inputs, condition on the, the output, condition on the inputs, by applying this function to uh, w, inner product between w and the feature vector. Uh, so we already know how to do logistic regression with these uh, artifacts. Uh, but if we combine layers of sigmoid units, this is going to increase the expressiveness. And we're going to see later 
uh, why why this is the case. Okay. Uh, the big one, the larger one. Okay. 64 minus 